All right, so today we're going to be diving into some questions regarding hormone replacement therapy in both men and women. This question came from a female. Uh, will taking testosterone change my voice? So dose dependent and administration dependent. So if you've got someone who's postmenopausal, for example, and they need hormone replacement therapy, right? We're probably not going to use injections, even though that is an option. Um, and then using like a topical cream or, or a vaginal insert is definitely not going to be to the dose that would thicken or hypertrophy the vocal cords. So probably not. In someone who's younger, for example, um, you know, maybe a young lady whose libido is low and they're it's kind of hurting the marriage or something like that from a relational perspective. Um, using testosterone again topically is probably not going to have that much of a systemic impact, especially if it's being used kind of as needed for, for sexual activity. And to clarify what I mean by sexual activity in the sense of, you know, younger women using it for libido uh, is to basically encourage lubrication, to encourage the aromatization of that testosterone into estradiol in the vaginal mucosa and um, in the labia, but also to get serum testosterone a bit higher, which is going to reach the brain and encourage you know, a greater desire for sex itself, and then also to help with uh, vasodilation in the clitoris to help with engorgement and obviously satisfaction with the sexual encounter. The place where this kind of myth really lends itself is to when women are using either higher dose of testosterone, they're using injectables, or using something else that's kind of converting more of the testosterone to DHT, which is kind of the end product of testosterone metabolism that really promotes deepening of the voice by thickening the vocal cords, you know, terminal hair growth, hair loss, acne. A lot of that comes from the actual dihydrotestosterone, not testosterone itself. The other area women get in trouble is by using anabolic steroids that have a much higher androgen ratio, or not even the ratio, they have a much, an, much higher anabolic component. Um, and then some of them, especially the orals, will have a high androgen um, ratio too. So it's not just the anabolic effect they're getting, but they're gonna be getting the androgenic effect as well. So again, if you're using it physiologically to replace for libido or you know just as needed for, for hormone replacement in menopause, unlikely to cause um, any um, thickening of the vocal cords. This next question was asked by both male and female. Will I break out if I take testosterone? Again, dose dependent. Men more likely than women because of the doses that they use and the routes that they're probably going to use. So most men are going to be using injection uh, because the concentration needed and the time frame and the half-lives, it all just kind of works out to be much easier. The degree of acne, again, is also going to be dependent on the other kinds of things that you're taking with it. So men often will take HCG to maintain testicular function and size while they're on testosterone, which will increase more of their androgenic ratio um, and cause more of the acne. Now, if you escalate the dose from small to mid to, you know, to moderate physiologic ranges, your body kind of has time to adapt the enzymes that take testosterone into DHT and so forth, but it also gives us time to kind of think, well, we've done this dose for a couple weeks or for three or four weeks, no acne yet, feeling good, awesome. Um, say that an individual wants to increase their dose and we're gonna say, well, okay, look, you haven't had any acne to this point. Turns out you're probably not going to get it if we stay within these parameters but maybe they want to go outside those parameters. So in those cases, there are mitigation strategies to prevent the acne from happening that is androgen-induced. That's important. So if they don't have acne before, they start taking the testosterone, and then you get acne, pretty causally related that it's the testosterone-induced uh, increase in sebum production in the follicle and um, you know, direct stimulation of the androgen receptors in the follicle itself. So in that case, there are different medications and tools we can use from saw palmetto and the actual natural agents to reduce 5-alpha reductase or use something like finasteride or dutasteride at low doses or topically to inhibit some of that oil production. Women, pretty much the same story. Again, really unlikely that they're going to get acne with the doses that they're using unless they're using more and more and kind of doing it continuously each day with lifting weights and, and, and not kind of taking care of the, the, the hygiene in the spots that they're getting acne. Um, it could also be compounded with using makeup and not washing your makeup off every night. So there's a lot more to do with, you know, the state of the skin in having more of an environment that's conducive to the growth or um, development of acne. The strategies that can also be used when someone develops the acne are plenty also, right? So, you know, most people will ask for some kind of topical either to spot treat and, you know, for that 
we have a, a skin line that we like to use called Epionce, and they have a great little gel that's called the Purifying Spot Gel. And literally, you can just use that once or, or twice in a, in a week, and your pimple will be gone. So the topical administrative route for mitigation of acne is a great one, too. So just to kind of proliferate any kind of um, issues that are happening in the skin or, or to block some of those issues from happening after you start the, the hormone therapy. Um, and then on top of that, there's a whole class of anti-acneic medications from clindamycin to help with the bacterial stuff for um, tretinoin to actually help with the skin cells themselves and you know things like niacinamide and azelaic acid and all these things that you've heard about in the commercials for acne. So they all work really well. You gotta get a handle on it before it really starts to get bad. But again, looking for it before you start these things is also an important consideration. Is taking testosterone bad for females? No. I mean, look, testosterone concentrations in females is, is higher than you'd think. I mean, especially if you take, if you were to draw blood from the ovary as compared to the, you know, the vein in the front of the arm, you're going to find that testosterone concentrations there are two-thirds of what a male's is, right? So with testosterone, the numbers that you read on your lab reports, you always have to look at the units. And if you think about how much estrogen you have or how much progesterone you have or how much testosterone you have, units really matter. And so if you think about the highest level of hormone floating around in your bloodstream, it is testosterone. So is taking women or is taking hormones or testosterone in particular bad for women? No, it's context dependent. Why are you doing it? Do you need it? Is it for some purpose in and of itself or is it just for the sake of taking testosterone? You know, it's, it, it's a poor question in general, I think, that just kind of misses the nuance of why someone would take testosterone. And you know, if you're looking to use it in general, you can always just look back to physiology. We have a shit ton of it. Are high levels of testosterone dangerous for men in relation to cancer? They, they can be. So, you know, I don't think there's any literature to show that testosterone levels being elevated is actually associated with cancer development. Um, I mean, especially since we're talking about androgen-dependent cancers, like prostate in men is kind of like the number one um, association there. But that being said, the, the, the teleological approach for thinking about this question comes down to who gets prostate cancer, and typically that's men over 65 when they've been devoid of appropriate testosterone levels or at least receptor signaling of that testosterone and androgen receptor for you know, 20 or 30 years. On the flip side, you don't see men in their 20s and 30s developing prostate tumors, right? So f again, thinking about it from the form and function point of view, if you have prostate cancer, the likelihood that taking testosterone is going to make it grow or become worse relatively high. Now, and personally, you know, having treated some cases of prostate cancer with testosterone and with some other um, tools, you know, it's obviously not a one-to-one -one consideration. Um, so going back to other kind of forms of cancer, testosterone in youth and reproductive fitness is, should not be associated with the development of cancer. Now, that doesn't take into account the numerous metabolic pathways that can lead to, you know, estrogen metabolism being inappropriate and generating different free radicals that are associated with cancer. So there's a, there's a lot more to this story, but testosterone in and of itself has not been shown to be or causing an increased risk for developing cancer. You know, again, I would say that with the decline of all hormones, the rate and incidence of cancer actually increases. So... There, there kind of stands to be an argument for the opposite. If you keep testosterone levels at the level of someone who's youthful, you know, what would the risk of cancer be in that case? How does taking testosterone affect my fitness? The way that most people are going to think about this are in terms of the ability to grow and develop more skeletal muscle mass and generate more force output, which means strength. So the stronger you are, the more you can lift, the more strength you're going to get. It's kind of the Matthew principle of lifting weights. So kind of going back to what to expect in terms of testosterone and fitness, I mean, number one, anabolic potential. So you're going to have greater protein synthesis. You're going to have a greater response to stressors on the muscle and on the bones. You're going to get better bone density. Um, you're going to have greater confidence, which is going to kind of, you know, for better or worse, make you more risk tolerant um, or 
yeah, risk averse, I'd suppose. Um, take more risks, which might, you know, actually end up hurting you because you might do too much um, on a barbell and lift too much weight and, and kind of hurt yourself in relation to tendon growth and connective tissue. Um, so it also increases, you know, circulating estrogen levels, which are associated with greater vasodilation and greater fat loss and so forth. And then, you know, testosterone's effect on the ability to burn through fat stores and triglycerides gives you the cardiometabolic side of things, but from a fitness perspective, also it's gonna make more energy available to the muscle tissues to use. It's gonna lean you out and kind of uh, and make you have a, a, um, a more lean physique. So again, muscle density, better strength, greater cardiorespiratory capacity with better cardiac output and perfusion and blood flow. Um, and then obviously the motivation and confidence to go and hit the gym more frequently, get better sleep, better recovery, you're less sore, you get more growth hormone at night because you're sleeping better. So all those things kind of add up even if they're indirect effects of taking testosterone, especially if you're hypogonadic or low. So when taking testosterone and one of the effects of it uh, providing more energy, will my sleep suffer? It's a good question. Um, I've definitely seen it, especially when the dose escalation is kind of too high uh, to start with. Um, it, it's funny because it doesn't really manifest in people feeling like they're not sleeping well or that they're not rested. They just kind of operate as good or better without as much sleep as they were having before. So it's definitely not a good trade-off because you know the clearance that you get and the memory consolidation with sleep is super important. Um, but typically it just kind of means, hey, take the dose back, dial it back a little bit if your sleep is being you know, affected. And um, this also kind of goes hand in hand with some of the mental effects of testosterone, kind of putting people in more of a manic space where they're just more confident. They want to get things done. They're getting this reward circuitry kicked on by saying pursue, pursue, pursue. We're on the right track. So just kind of helping people navigate what to expect, you know, sometimes giving people some ashwagandha at the same time or some phosphatidylserine just to kind of ease up on some of their newfound um, adrenal force. Do I become more fertile when I take testosterone? This one's tough. Per personal anecdote here too. Having been told that testosterone is going to make um, men infertile my whole medical career, um, I, I went into my marriage kind of assuming that that was the case. Well, having been off of it for, you know, a good amount of time and kind of navigating, well, hey, well, maybe, you know, kids aren't in the stars for us. I got back on, on my uh, therapy and, and literally within three weeks, we were pregnant. So there's an important lesson here that if someone is truly hypogonadic, which alert, I was, um, and they're taking therapy, well, then, you know, testosterone is required for intratesticular testosterone levels to be adequate, and that's also required for the generation and maturation and um, synthesis of semen and sperm. So if someone's truly hypogonadic, they're going to be infertile until they get testosterone levels up. Then when they get testosterone levels up, whether it be exogenous or endogenous from um, some of the different therapy, the time period which they will be exceptionally fertile is after that point. So you get more production of sperm inside the testicle. You get better maturation, better quality, so better morphology and better capacity for flagella to work right, and, and to actually synthesize. So yes and no. Taking testosterone when you need it can make you more fertile for a certain period of time. Eventually, the testosterone level is going to feed back to the brain to shut down you know, testicular production. The testicles will start to atrophy, and at that point, you are no longer fertile. Right now, is that the end of the world? No, because there's plenty of things that we can do to restart the hypothalamic pituitary um, secretion of gonadotropins and the LH and FSH that are going to educate the um, sperm cells and create uh, more of them. So things like HCG and things like enclomiphene, things like Tonkat Ali, things like Sustanch tubulosa. There's plenty of tools to use to increase endogenous synthesis of testosterone whether it be by promoting pituitary release of LH and FSH or stimulating testicular LH and FSH receptors um, without their gonadotropin release from the pituitary. Will my sex life improve when I take testosterone? Um, 
Yes and no. I mean, I've seen some men have a really high sex drive on testosterone, but then report that, you know, their orgasm quality isn't as good as it was before, that, you know, if they're not taking HCG or some other um, pituitary testicular stimulant, that the volume of ejaculate gets worse and that actually manifests in, you know, less enjoyable um, climax. So yes and no, it could definitely make you more uh, potent and have greater libido, but it might not do anything to your lasting power, right? So if you're still a two pump chump, like is it gonna make you last longer? No, probably not. Um, so in regard to the qualitative effect of testosterone on your sex life, it kind of depends on the person and it depends on the other tools that are available to you know, fix what else they might consider not great.